Hello, I am Marina Frolova Walker. I am professor of music history at the Faculty of Music, University of Cambridge, and I'm also a fellow of Clare College. I've been asked to record a little sample lecture for you so that you have an idea of what we do here in music history courses. And of course, this is going to be a little bit fake because first of all, it's going to be much shorter than what we do, because at least I think the shortest lecture that we have is, is an hour long. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, I would be delivering it to a screen and uh, not being inspired by your smiley faces, by your inquiring eyes. So it's probably not going to be quite the same experience. But nevertheless, uh, let's try and do this. I've chosen as my topic um, one of the mysteries of, of Shostakovich. I've chosen Shostakovich because you might have encountered this composer in your A-level music course and uh, you've probably heard some of his symphonies because they're performed so much and uh, he's a fascinating figure because his music is uh, very often so tightly connected to real life either to history to political history of the soviet union for example or to his own biography or to other things and um, we might even think that to some extent he is relevant to our times as well so um this is why I would I have chosen Shostakovich, and I've chosen a, a particular uh, mystery um, related to one of the movements of his symphonies. So my title is Shostakovich, and uh, someone um, or something uh, six letters long, uh, and it's going to be primarily focused on the third movement of his tenth symphony. Now, his 10th symphony, you can see the first page of his uh, autograph score, uh, his signature there and his uh, handwriting. Uh, as you can see, it was written in 1953. And 1953 was a huge, uh, hugely important watershed in Soviet culture because that was the year when uh, Iosif Stalin, uh, the leader of the Communist Party and the Soviet state, died. Yeah. So the watershed was between the, the period of great oppression uh, during which there was a cult of Stalin, yeah, he was venerated and worshipped, um, believed to be a great genius, and uh, the period of the so-called thaw, yeah, when repression was slightly loosened, and when on the contrary Stalin was declared a criminal, um, a mass murderer, uh, and incredibly oppressive dictator, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great uh, landmark year. So uh, there is a quote um, in existing literature that connects the 10th symphony uh, of Shostakovich explicitly to uh, Stalin's death. And this is the quote, I did depict Stalin in my next symphony, the 10th. I wrote it right after Stalin's death and no one has yet guessed what the symphony is about. Now remember that, what the symphony is about. It's about Stalin and the Stalin years. The second part, or the second movement, we should say, the scherzo is a musical portrait of Stalin, roughly speaking, yeah? a musical portrait of Stalin. Of course, there are many other things in it, but that's the basis. So, well, if Shostakovich tells us that <laughs> this is what the symphony is about, we should believe him, shouldn't we? But um, there's a slight problem with the source from which this quote comes, because it's, uh, it's a book called Testimony. Uh, many people have read it. It's very, very popular. And it presents itself as being uh, Shostakovich's, own, Shostakovich's own memoir. Uh, but in fact, the scholars have proved that it cannot be the case. Uh, it can't be a completely authorized Shostakovich's words. Um, in fact, it's a compilation of various sources, and that threw so much doubt uh, on that on this source that we now have to take it with a huge grain of salt. Yeah, because essentially it purports to be something that it isn't. Yeah, so it's a compilation by Solomon Volkov, um, and this is why uh, we are we are slightly um, doubtful about everything that comes from it. But nevertheless, uh, if we hear this scherzo, it's very easy to imagine that it is a portrait of Stalin because the huge, vi hugely violent music, um, it has this great drive, 
it's not really at all a, a joking scherzo, it's a terrifying scherzo. And to give you a, a taste of that, I've decided not to play you um, a symphonic version, but actually a version uh, for piano for hands, because we have this very historic recording um, by Shostakovich himself and his friend and disciple Moise Weinberg, who was also a composer and also a very good pianist, and Shostakovich was too. So this is actually how um, people, you know, Shostakovich's peers, other composers, other musicians in Russia, this is how they heard the symphony for the first time. Yeah, they've heard it on the piano, played by the composer himself and Weinberg. exciting a very, very very virtuosic performance and has this this incredible drive so um if you're interested by the way which part Shostakovich was playing i can tell you it was a secondo part yeah so he was in the bass but nevertheless you know they're, they're both equally virtuosic actually so um now i'm not going to be talking actually about the scherzo the second moment i'm going to talk about the third moment which is not quite a slow moment as you would expect but it's a kind of allegretto moderate type movement, uh, which has a little bit of, of scherzo feel about it as well. Uh, this is the very beginning of it. So quite a vague atmosphere, very difficult to be described. That becomes all a little bit more concrete in the next theme. And listen to it very carefully because you might recognize something about it. Well, I didn't know to what extent you know uh, this little motif. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, but it's actually Shostakovich's signature. Yeah, so this is a fascinating, um, fascinating musical device that some composers can use, some of them who have musical signatures. Usually they use the German notation. Um, so a H, for example, yeah, is, is a B. Uh, in our uh, more common English notation. Yeah, but D is the same, D is a D. Uh, e flat is S, yeah, so you can use it as S, mm, and uh, C is a C. Yeah, so you have Dmitry Shostakovich in four notes. And this is uh, a, a little motif that he uses quite a lot in his, in his pieces, but the 10th symphony was one of the very first major pieces where you can hear it very clearly. Yeah, so, because he uses it a lot, it's very difficult to say what it means at every point. But uh, nevertheless, uh, in this case, yeah, it it could bear relation to his own uh, persona, yeah, or his own person even. And we'll see how the, how that plays out in the future. So uh, D S C H is present in that theme. 
Now, uh, the next thing I wanted to play you is the beginning of the middle section. And the middle section of this movement contains a horn solo. And again, listen to it very carefully. <laughs> So you heard that in the horn solo, you had the same uh, theme or, or motif, I guess, that contains five notes. And this is what it looks like in the score, in the horn part. Now, uh, you can po pause the lecture at this point and uh, work out what the notes are. Yeah, horn is a French horn is a transposing instrument. So um, you have to transpose it. Um, by a fifth down. Yeah, so eventually this is what you get. E, A, E, D, E. So five uh, notes. And you heard uh, those five notes twice already. Yeah, once in forte, another one played piano. Uh, it's actually uh, repeated um, 11 times. Yeah, so there are 12 statements all together in that middle movement and always at the same pitch. So it's, uh, it's almost like an ostinato theme going through this whole middle section. And people found that it's, uh, it's a very mysterious thing to have there, yeah, that unchanging tune. And one of the Shostakovich scholars, um, David Fanning, even suggested that it might be another name. It might be another cipher. Yeah, since we already had DSCH and DSCH people were uh, aware of, you know, for a long time they had been aware of that. But uh, this, uh, this was a mystery. So, and David Fanning turned out to be right. Because indeed it is a name. And I will show you how the name is derived. Uh, because we can also use um, alternative notation. Yeah, we can use these sulfa syllables. And then it's going to be mi, la, mi, re, la. And then if we combine both of them, uh, what you get is the name Elmira. Uh, of course, you can't, you can't uh, figure this out just from the score unless you're looking for El Elmira. And uh, the only reason to look for Elmira that there was actually a real Elmira in Shostakovich's life. And uh, after Shostakovich's death and towards the end of Elmira's life, we found out what really happened because she, uh, she told us this story herself. She told to the musicologist Nelly Kravitz who wrote about it. So it turns out that Elmira Nazirova was a Shostakovich's composition student for a very short time. She was a graduate student um, and uh, he fell in love with her and became quite obsessed and started writing letters to her. And she was, of course, much younger and didn't reciprocate. And then she, she went away. Um, and, and that was that. But during that summer of 1953, uh, that was the summer when all that story played out. So Shostakovich obviously was thinking of her a lot and also possibly thinking of the possibility of, of writing her into his score because she had a musical name. So uh, now that we know a corroboration of this story and there is actually a, a, even a physical object, a score that he presented to her with, uh, with a secret dedication, to her with an inscription that she kept secret for many years. So now we know the connection and now we know that this theme is in fact Elmira's theme. And that throws a new light on the whole symphony because we then realize that DSCH and Elmira yeah, kind of for, form this strange mismatched couple, musical couple in that movement because she is always kind of aloof and above all the textures, always unchanged, kind of unattainable. Yeah, and uh, there's all kinds of things going on uh, around her. So, so if you if you like, you can build up this narrative of this unrequited love for the third movement, at least. Yeah. So now that we find out that the tenth symphony is not just about Stalin, but it's also about a private story which Shostakovich at that point wanted to hide. 
Uh, and I must say this, uh, when I found out about that, I, I rejoiced because I, I, I'm so tired that Shostakovich is always tied exclusively to political events in the Soviet Union and presented as a kind of chronicler of his time. And uh, it seems like he was almost sort of obsessed with Stalin and all he wrote was about Stalin. And of course, it is not true. Yeah, because people were at the same time living their uh, more normal private lives and sometimes events of these private lives were more more important than the political oppression that they all experienced. So it's a kind of refreshing to know that there is something else in the 10th symphony. But there is another aspect to this and uh, that other name that I'd like to introduce is, is Gustav Mahler. Because uh, apparently Shostakovich hadn't realized that, but this theme, the horn theme, in the 10th symphony is very similar to the very beginning of Mahler's huge, uh, big scale, large scale work, Das Lied von der Erde, Song of the Earth. It's a kind of symphony, but with voices. Yeah, so unnumbered symphony. Uh, and uh, you will be able to hear this connection. Uh, very clearly, I'm going to play it now. This is very, very beginning of the uh, of the work. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here it is. Yeah, again, and uh, here it is in comparison with the Elmira theme, and you can see this is also a horn theme, although not a solo horn, and it has basically the same pitches. So even if Shostakovich consciously hadn't realized this connection, um, it probably was somewhere uh, in the forefront of the back of his mind, so to speak. Yeah, uh, Because, of course, he knew Mahler very well, and Mahler was one of his most favorite composers, as somebody who, who acted as a kind of model for, for a lot of his symphonic work. So when this was pointed out to him, he was absolutely delighted. And of course, now we know that in his mind it was the Almira theme, and now he found out the Almira theme coincidentally, or maybe not quite coincidentally, is connected to Mahler as well. Yeah, so uh, actually, interestingly, sort of almost uh, the same letters uh, in, in, in the word Mahler as, as in Elmira. Uh, so, uh, delightful coincidence, uh, and um, obviously the turmoil of Mahler's work is, is very relevant to the 10th symphony as well. So, um, what should we talk about when we talk about the 10th symphony? Should we talk about Shostakovich and Stalin? Should we talk about Shostakovich and Elmira? Or should we talk about Shostakovich and Mahler, perhaps? Yeah, and that is the point at which I have to warn you that uh, in our music historical courses, very few questions have simple answers or yes or no answers or, or definite answers. Yeah, for most of the questions that we tend to ask, um, there is no right answer and you'll just have to argue your way to some kind of conclusion that you... Uh, would like to make and this is the fun of it and this is we want to challenge you we want to, to make you think critically we want you to distrust the sources that you encounter because not every source is as um, as certain yeah and as truthful as as another source so we have to um, we want to teach you to evaluate these various things and make up basically your own narratives your own arguments your own stories and present them to us and without necessarily looking for the right answer. So my conclusion would be that the 10th symphony might be compared, uh, connected to all, all of these three names yeah, in, in various ways. And the beauty with music that you shouldn't, uh, is that you shouldn't imagine it as a piece of music, uh, a symphony, yeah, for example, being like a novel where you can have one narrative. And although we very often like imagining these narratives because they make it so fun, yeah, listening to music, imagining various scenarios, connecting ourselves somehow to this music through it, we shouldn't imagine that that is necessarily the truth. And this is how the composer was thinking. Yeah, a piece of music is always more than any kind of verbal content that we might suggest. 
and uh, it doesn't necessarily stick to just one strand. So even if there is a piece of very uh, strong and incontrovertible evidence about the 10th symphony connecting it to Elmira and a slightly less tangible one connecting it to Stalin and something else connecting it to Mahler, uh, we cannot say which of the stories is actually more important for it. Yeah, it's very difficult to determine. With that, I leave you to ponder it further. And if you are interested in Shostakovich, just for further reading, I would suggest that you read this uh, very new uh, little biography, quite a short biography uh, in the series Critical Lives that was written by Paul and Fairclough. And that will serve as very good introduction as a very uh, reliable, I would say, source, at least for now, um, uh, a very reliable introduction to Shostakovich's life and his works. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye.